Welcome to the Minimalist CEO Podcast with Nate Lindquist. Nate created the Minimalist CEO Method to help business owners redefine and grow their businesses by finding new demand in places they never thought to look where there's no competition. By following his opposite thinking strategy, Nate's coaching clients have grown their business up to 40% in just two months and created tens of millions of dollars in revenue. Nate himself has launched more than 140 businesses. On the show, Nate interviews successful business owners and experts who share the secrets you can use to have a better business and a better life. Hey everyone, welcome to the next episode of the Minimalist CEO Podcast. I'm Nate Lindquist and I've got a great guest to introduce you to. It's timely, of course, when you hear the topic and you hear about our guest expertise, we're talking about Kevin Godfrey is an occupational health and safety expert. This guy's doing some really interesting things with biohazard testing and uh, with gyms. I'm just going to let him tell the story. It's pretty amazing, but you're going to want to pay attention. Kevin Godfrey, welcome to the Minimal CEO podcast. Well, thank you very much, Nate. Glad to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you. I would love to start right out of the gate. I want people to get to know you a little bit. Sure. What are you, what are you working on right now? So uh, right now, it's pretty much our, our main focus. So if we take a step back, I've pretty much been in the cleaning industry for, for 20 years. You know, we, we started off as a mom and pop through my, my mother actually had, had the company before she passed away. And she was really focused on residential. And then when I started to really take over, we moved to commercial. And fast forward 20 years, our main focus right now is pretty much the testing and verification of the cleaning. Right, because anyone can say that they're cleaning, but without the right testing and metrics in place, no one really knows for sure. And in today's world, believing, uh, seeing is believing. Right, so the safer that people can demonstrate to their members or their clients, etc., that their their business actually is, the more members and clients will actually come back. So mm -hmm. that's what we're actually in the business of right now: helping companies reopen safely and mm -hmm. staying open. So interesting. I see you have a you have a background in water restoration and in cleaning residential and commercial. Is that right? right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you said an interesting thing, and I'd love it if you could expand on it. Now there's businesses that have the open sign up, but mm -hmm. I don't see. I haven't seen the neon lights come out yet that say clean and safe in the window yet, or metrics that say this percent you know, dangerous biohazard virus in our place. And I think that um, it's interesting. It's telling in the times that we're in. So how do we, how do you mm -hmm. advise that a business owner addresses that issue? Uh, what do you have to tell them about it? Well, so, you know, pretty much one of the, with what we do, right? So we're testing the adenosine triphosphate, ATP levels. And in the simplest non-nerdy way I can go about it. it. It's basically just a, an organic biofilm on all surfaces that promote bacteria, germs, and viruses, right? So the higher the biofilm levels, the higher the ATP levels, the more susceptible you are to having a potential for cross-contamination, right? It's not a COVID test. You're, we're not testing a keyboard and saying that has COVID. And if you touch it, you're going to get COVID because those tests actually don't work. They're just, it's just not so basically the ATP test takes 15 seconds, right? We swab it, we put it into luminometer, it shoots a laser through it. And then within 15 seconds, it'll say what the biofilm levels are. If we were testing for surface COVID, it takes six to eight days. By that time, a hundred people have walked into the building, touched it, touched their faces. And even if you have a negative six to eight days when we tested, by the time you get the results, someone could have come in and contaminated the place, right? So you're either operating on a false negative a false positive, right? So there's, there's a whole lot of uh, different things going around with that. So we're really focusing on helping businesses show the verification to members. And the easiest way to do that is through this ATP testing. So when you say we, that's a, there's a collective, there's a group that you're a part right. of, you're directing yeah. a group. Tell us a little bit more about the organization that you're leading. So through the actual testing portion of it. That's uh, our company, my company, trustedsafe.org. And through that testing arm of our overall environmental group, the cleaning company. So basically it goes environmental group. Testing is the, uh, you know, a subsidiary of that. And then with that experience and with how we've been helping various industries reopen uh, during COVID, you know, phase one, two, three, four, et cetera, we were, I was asked to come on board as the director of fitness safe, 
which is through the United States Fitness Coalition, the USFC. And pretty much that is the largest coalition of gyms, fitness facilities, spas, yoga, Pilates, et cetera, uh, in New York State. And these are hard hit businesses. So you're out there, you've pivoted in a way that actually I haven't heard before. You're coming from cleaning and restoration. You made the transition and said, listen, there's a problem here. Mm -hmm. I have expertise some occupational health and safety expertise. You also understood testing from, you know, looking at probably I would imagine mold remediation, understanding if the water's really gone and if things Mm -hmm. are really clean. And now you've made the transition into like, okay, we got to help places get back open, but they can't just be open. And, And we mentioned before we jumped on to the interview that there's places that are open and have been open mm-hmm. that are not clean and no one seems to mind. So let's no. talk about that first. <laughs> All right. I'm not going to get into names because I don't want to get sued, but the uh, nature of the business or thing, let's talk about right. the pattern that you've noticed because you obviously had to make a big transition here. I know it, it I think right. everyone's going to want to know how did you make the transition and what mm-hmm. did you notice that drove you to make this transition? Sure. So, so for the last seven years, we've been testing uh, for the ATP. Okay. So that is just, to be honest, it was more of a marketing tool initially, right? Because people don't necessarily inherently understand what we're testing. But if we were testing just general cleaning products and we would say, hey, you know, here is the, the results, what we did worked, right? You are within acceptable thresholds per the CDC. Uh, they said, okay, great, cool. And you know, or we would be brought in to verify other cleaning companies work. And like I said beforehand, uh, when we do that, we never take that cleaning job because, uh, you know, that could be a huge conflict of interest. We could just fail everybody and then try to swoop in and, and take it. That's not what that's not really what we're about. So once COVID hit and actually my five year old daughter pretty much like I guess she caught, you know, the news or heard it in school or whatever it is, but she became OCD. Like she was washing her hands 37 times a day. And at five years old, it's just, you know, sad to watch her. You know, she touches something and she runs in and she washes her hands for 20 minutes, right? And Anything just, over like, 20 minutes is a lot of hand washing. Yeah. It's and like, it was, and, yeah. And it was like 20 <laughs> plus times a day. And my five-year-old was just having like a mental breakdown. So from from it and um, from all the, the scare media on, on TV, right? So mm-hmm. I actually had my luminometer there one day and I was like, listen, you know, look, I'm going to show you how this science works. And I actually taught my, my five-year-old about the testing and the ATP and everything else. And, and she actually, when it tests and it tests as a pass, it comes, it does green with a little check mark. And that's actually our logo because when I showed it to her, she goes, oh, it's, I can trust this, right? It's safe, right? Trusted safe. So she actually named it (laughs) in the process. And once she started to do that at five years old, she started using the swabs and the luminometer. And we started going around the house and testing things herself because it's very easy to do. And that actually got her away from her OCDs. Like it pulled her back from the the brink of insanity at five years old. So she actually named that. And once I saw what it did for her on a grander scale, I said, well, we could just do this for businesses as for, you know, specifically for COVID, for their marketing, for their members, uh, to get members back in the door, for their employees, um, just confidence in the fact that they're doing the right thing to make sure everyone that enters that building is safe. And so that's really how we, we actually pivoted into the trusted safe brand. So if you could expand just for a second, Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin, as you talk about, well, it was originally for marketing and, you know, having a depth of understanding and experience in the small service business space, I've noticed that there's a lot of people doing restoration. There's a lot of people doing rebuild. There's a lot Mm -hmm. of people doing fire and smoke and water, but you said, Hey, we're going to do testing. Mm Mm-hmm. Before you started doing the trusted safe, before COVID right. and all that, this is seven years ago. Tell me a little bit, just expand a little bit about how you made that move into testing and then what it did for your business as you moved in that for marketing, moved in that direction. Sure. So we initially got into the testing because we were forced to. So the cleaning aspect of the company, when we initially started, like I said, it was mom and pop, very residential. When I got involved, we started to pivot towards insurance jobs. So we were doing a lot of remediation for insurance companies through insurance adjusters. And part of that was that they started to ask for verification. And we actually had to, as a form, to keep the insurance jobs. And then once we started doing that for insurance jobs, we started offering that to our just normal commercial accounts and everything else. 
And what happened to business when you started saying, hey, we're doing this testing. We now have a metric we can share that we're a standard that we're going to meet. Mm -hmm. First of all, did you feel like it was a, a, point of, a point of differentiation that no one else was doing in your space? Yeah, 100%. So no one else was really offering it. And what we essentially did was make different. Uh, it wasn't the trusted safe brand at that point, but we had stickers made up and we had little QR codes and everything else. And, and pretty much when we would do these tests for our, our accounts, we would share it with them on their social media. And then they would then share it to their members and their email lists and everything else. So it became a very organic uh, marketing flow or marketing funnel that we were able to capture because no one else was doing it. And no one wants to promote their own building safety and health more than that business. So they were going out of their way and spending money to do it, to promote us. And so people were promoting what you were doing, probably a lot of buzz around this concept of ATP mm -hmm. testing. And you put it into your messaging, you put it in your stickers, you put it into your QR yeah. codes, you put it into mm -hmm. flyers. You know, it's interesting. I notice, and again, in the minimal CEO process, what we mm -hmm. talk about a lot is people like band-aids. They like to say, hey, I'm going to put all my messaging into my marketing and I'm going to say things that are clever. I'm going to have an irresistible offer. But what I've noticed is what you did might have initially been like, first of all, a standard you had to meet for insurance, mm -hmm. obviously offered a, uh, an ongoing marketing message benefit. But it seems like it, it did the one thing that we teach our clients to do is go back and be fascinated with what people really need and actually inform the product or the service. Mm -hmm. and let that change to actually help people better in a way that other people aren't getting the help in a way that other people aren't serving. You just, you did that. Now, was that intentional or do you, do you feel like it just was like this happened very naturally and you saw that it was working? Well, you know, it was once I recognize, I don't know, you know, it, it really chicken or the egg type thing. So I, I actually have a fairly extensive marketing background. So it's one of those things where when it happened, it was like, oh, you know, we can turn this into something we can turn this something on itself. So it really organically and very quickly grew out as a whole separate, separate entity. And it really was just because people were able to buy the, they were buying the results, you know, of the cleaning because what made us different was that everyone cleans, right? So everyone has a janitorial service at night. They have to, otherwise every commercial building would be filthy. Every strip mall would be, you know, you know, they have the, obviously have their staff clean throughout the day, but most of them have two, three, four times a week, a cleaning company come in as a deep clean, but we offered them the ability to take that expense, the already ongoing expense and turn it into a marketing expense because now they're promoting what everyone else is doing, but they're just offering it in a unique way. Okay. So it became a selling tool for right. your clients as well, for your customers. Right. Yeah. 100%. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, bring us into a conversation. You don't have to say who the client was when <laughs> there was a realization, like what did you tell them? Hey, you can use this in your marketing or did they just notice it? So it was one of the very first ones that we had, you know, we, we had the little stickers made up and we said, okay, you know, we've put it on their door and said, you're clean and certified and disinfected and all that stuff. And they actually took a picture of it because this was, you know, years and years ago, but they took a picture of it on their phone and posted it on a Facebook mom group. And they were like, oh, hey, look at this. You know, we got clean and tested. And they said the reaction was so immediate and and powerful it was it was a kids um you know like one of those little gymnasium things where the kids come in and they jump on the mats and stuff yeah, but, and it, yeah little slides it, it's not like a play area but it, it was like uh the balance beams and stuff like that okay if i said the name you would know it but I'm, i don't know so, cool. you don't right. have to do that yeah so uh but basically once they did that they said they had people sharing it organically and naturally on Facebook saying, oh my God, I can't believe it. I'm so lucky that I send my kid to this place that takes their health and safety uh, serious, right? And then it just sort of spread naturally and organically on uh, Facebook. And they approached me and said, hey, you know, I, thanks. <laughs> you know, we, I think they signed within the next two weeks, uh, you know, it was something between like 10 and 15 new, new parents just from that one post on Facebook. So- <laughs> You know, they were paying us already to clean and, and that was a monthly ongoing membership mm. for the parents. So each one was like a hundred bucks. So, you know, that was an extra 1500 bucks a month that they made. They were only paying me 125 bucks a week. So it's uh, and at a thousand bucks. They'll take that all day. It, it, we could, we could call this episode how clean certified goes viral. Right. I think that'd be, I think that'd <laughs> be perfect. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. So you made the shift. You recently launched your program, trustedsafe.org. Mm -hmm. Can you um, 
tell us about what it's like to be on track to, to, to have this. It's relatively new, correct? Trust yeah. Me. Yeah. So this brand was dollars or more in revenue. You're probably mm-hmm. from what you're telling me, you're going to surpass that you've made contributions to organizations and where you were, lo- where you're located to right. testing kits. What's it like and how are you growing so quickly? What are you putting in place to make that happen? So we did hit the million plus in cleaning a long time ago. And that was really f- specifically for the insurance jobs. You know, one, once we pivoted away from small residential jobs and we, we went to the insurance jobs and then we locked in a lot of monthly clients. So with Trusted Safe, we sort of took the same approach and we started off as only monthly subscriptions, right? So if you want to come in and get tested, that's great, but we don't really do the one-offs because you have to lock in for at least uh, three months just because it takes that time to develop a cleaning protocol. So what happens is that when we send them, you know, these test swabs, we can either do it in person. We send our team, if it's Long Island, uh, New York based, or we started to do nationally to other, um, right now we're in California, New Jersey. Where was the other one? Montana and Wisconsin. Are these gyms? You're talking about when you say they. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So we, we've done focused on gyms to, as the initial test industry. Who's doing that? Thing. Are you sending the kits out and they're doing it? Or do you have teams that are going out to do it? So both, it, it depends. So if it's a large commercial client, because some gyms are 30 to 40,000 square feet, right? So they, they can't do that. So we have, we're able to um, sort of outsource the collection and the testing remotely, or we are able to offer, it's a different type of swab and a whole different sort of service. It's obviously still through Trust Safe, but we mail that, we do a Zoom such as this, and we cre- we've created, based on CDC protocols, a checklist of where they can test and how they get the test back to us, uh, how they have to keep you know, the, the swabs refrigerated because they're essentially perishable items. So there's actually a lot of infrastructure that we had to create in order to do this correctly. Mm-hmm. And um, because of that, there are a couple of companies that obviously do environmental testing and everything else, but no one that has done it the way we've done it. So once we sort of offered our unique selling proposition, it different, it pulled us out of that same market, right? So we're not actually competing with other companies that are doing air quality testing or mold testing. This is really for businesses that um, have been hit hard by COVID, need to reopen, need to reopen safely, but need to prove that they're reopening safely. And that's really where we have found our little niche. Yeah, it sounds brilliant what you're doing. It's obviously making a huge difference in the community. You've ramped up really quickly. Are you still running the water remediation, uh, water yeah. damage restoration business? Yeah, so we, I have staff taking really care of that. And I've been focusing on the, the trusted safe aspect of it because I'm actually really, I really am actually passionate about it because I, I, I find it fascinating and it actually has the ability to help so many different people. You know, so for example, again, for the fitness industry, there's currently 80 to 100,000 people out of work in the fitness industry in New York state, just Mm -hmm. in New York state. Right. And then if you go one level below and take, you know, all the, and add all the personal trainers and all the coaches and, and you really start to then go down and down and down, it it goes up to about a half a million people directly tied to the fitness industry in New York state Wow, that are unemployed. And one of the things that we've been doing is working with the local and state governments to figure out how to amend the current protocols and guidelines. And we've, ri- I've written some, I've written some of the updates. I was part of writing the initial reopening protocols. So we're actually pretty entrenched in with the local governments and state governments to, to help these businesses open up safely, because obviously the goal is not to keep everyone shut forever. You, you You're know. an advocate for getting these places open, getting them open and, and making sure they're safe and clean. That is exactly right. Yeah. And then letting the members choose to go there, right? Because right now it's just like, we're going to keep them closed because they might be dirty, but we can 100% show that that's not the case. And then it goes back to free market. You know, if you maintain the cleanliness, if you can prove it, if you offer masks, if you don't offer masks, then you will either get clients or you won't. Well, there's so many different paths that we could go down right yeah. now. <laughs> and I think about the disparity between you got to have a mask and like, what about everything else that we're touching? You right. seem to be hitting on that really well. And I sense, I look at mobilization of a company trying to scale, and that's something mm-hmm. I spend a lot of time on with, with my clients. And it sounds like a, a mobilization, a real mobilization challenge to train and certify people to go do, to be virtual contract team members, to go out and, and gather the, use the swabs, do the testing, or bring the test back to you 
back mm. to your lab, back to your, your organization. Do you have a facility, a testing facility? Is this a facility that you run? How are you training these people? I mean, how do you mobilize? Well, maybe I should ask how many different, <laughs> groups, how many different groups are you working with? To, right. to, to try yeah. to mobilize. Well, so staff, the, the virtual, the people that we have going out into the world and, and testing on our behalf, we have 12 people right now and they're spread through Long Island, um, downstate, you know, New York City metro area, and then all the way up to Buffalo. So most of it is training uh, via Zoom. We have, I've created an online, basically training modules through like Kajabi, you know, and like they go in and they'll, they'll do that kind of stuff. And basically what we're really doing is it's really only getting the boots on the ground. And it's, to be honest, they have the, the minimalist amount of information necessary to do what they do. But then, cause at the end of the day, I'm the one that still has to sign off on everything. So I don't need to teach them everything. I just need to teach them how to do the swabs. And there is a process on how to swab correctly, uh, what swabs to use for different facilities, different CDC thresholds per type of facility, right? So there is a lot of back end that we've developed in conjunction with the state. So it's actually not even something that another company could really jump into because it's a lot of the overall process is, is IP, to be honest. So, yeah. So doing it right, mm -hmm. is less important than like, you know, you can get the swabs. ATP testing has been around for a long time, right? But you're educating, you're training people to do the correct process. So now there's systems and you're, you got the boots on the ground going out to do it. So having that implementation out in the field, right? And that's, that's what puts us apart from pretty much everyone else yeah. trying to offer it. And we have seen some people try to offer it, you know, <laughs> since, since we've been popping up on the news and whatnot, but they just can't offer the services in the way we offer them. I'm curious, what, you know, what are some of the challenges that you're facing here? You're trying to oversee two businesses, plus mm -hmm. your director, plus you're working with the government, plus you're trying to recruit and find these virtual right. team members. <laughs> and you're kind of bouncing between these, these two businesses as well. Right. How do you do that? What are the challenges that you're facing? You know, just like any entrepreneur, right? You know, we, uh, we work 100 hours to avoid working 40 hours for somebody else, right? You know, the old, the old saying. So we, you just have to keep trudging through. <laughs> that's, that's really it. It's, the time is just trying to obviously balance the work life, the family life. Uh, if kids in school that are going through their whole, you know, plexiglass caged existence. And so, you know, it's really just trying to balance everything. But it's a lot of late nights. You know, so like tonight I'll be packaging swabs to mail out up until 4 a.m. <laughs> you know, and that's just, it's just how it goes. Do you foresee right. that things streamlining, maybe having a, you know, scaling your team to help free you up as this continues to grow? Yeah, I have to. I have to. Otherwise, it'll consume me. And um, I have to, at some point, remove myself from the process because otherwise I'm going to become the bottleneck, you know, in the scale. So. Um, Common problem in business. Yeah. 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 It's, you know. And I haven't figured out exactly how to do that yet. So that's why I'm packaging swabs at four in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting. We could, have a, we could have a deeper conversation. One of the things in the minimalist CEO method I help, I help talk to my clients about is mm -hmm. have one big project. You got to pick one. Now, even though mm -hmm. you're your businesses, you have to frame your big quest, your big goal right. as one. Mm -hmm. And then you turn everything else into rituals and you look at, lead development, conversion, production capability. And at such point that each person or phase of production becomes max capacity, you have to have the system that says, okay, here's the next person. Here's how they're trained. Get right. them rolled out and get them started. And I think there's a theme that, that uh, I'm hearing it in my interviews. I'm hearing it from you. Do you have to have that place? I've even felt it where you've got to get, you got to be working at 120% of what you're what you feel like you're really capable of, but couldn't sustain. Right. Have your money model down, understand that it's <laughs> profitable, understand that it's working and helping people because it's all about a helping system, which right. you get. Mm -hmm. And then you have to put that production capability in place and make sure the rituals are there to measure how it's going. So you can be the one who's looking at the red light, the green light, and the yellow light. Mm -hmm. soon. <laughs> soon. soon. I'll figure that out soon. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, what you're doing is a huge amount of difference making. And I'd be curious, how do you stay on the cutting edge? I mean, you're, you're keeping your business growth obviously growing right now, you're in the right. early stages, but how are you going to maintain that? Obviously, the, we don't know where COVID's going. We don't mm -hmm. know when places will be open in phase four and then, hey, we're all open again. Right. What phase life is back. What do you do to stay on the, on, you know, keeping your growth successful and sustainable so you can keep helping and doing what you're doing? So because of really what's, what's actually 
fostering the growth is our, our government contracts, uh, partnerships rather. So, you know, we have, we deal with a lot of schools, especially some special needs schools. We deal with um, the department of health. So we have calls with them every week. So really we are adjusting in real time to what they're saying that they need. You know, so if they have an outbreak, for example, and, you know, right now an outbreak is defined as like three kids. So if they have that, we know that we have to do a little bit of damage control. We have to go in there. We have to, because they bring in their, so different states have different guidelines, but, you know, for New York state, for example, if, if a child confirms a positive case in, in the classroom, they only actually have to have their staff come in and do a deep clean. So like they don't need to hire like a fancy company or anything like that. And after 24 hours, it's essentially um, reopened. But because of our partnerships, you know, that's not going away because they want us to still come in, do the testing, and then they take that testing and then they email it out to all the parents or to everyone in the district. So, you know, we're getting that ongoing free marketing every time someone actually does have a suspected or confirmed case because they're, they're using us as that seal of approval. Mm-hmm. And as that's long as affiliate, <laughs> yeah, that's the Department of Health is a powerful affiliate. Yes. That's good. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, as long as that keeps going and, you know, I don't see it necessarily slowing down, you know, infection rates are obviously on the rise right now and hospitalizations and all that whatnot. But even if that starts to decrease, it's still in the back of people's mind, especially when it comes to their kids. Right. So I'm pretty much projecting at least, you know, another year of of this kind of trajectory. And uh, based on that, with our monthly subscriptions, then we can obviously pull that those funds out and and pivot and adjust as needed, you know, depending it's on where the next a long-term is. model that's like, listen, we need this indefinitely, regardless of what's happening in the news or with COVID that like, it's time to take facility hygiene seriously. Exactly. You know, and, and, you know, it basically, we went from like right now we're actually in, I'm seeing actually a couple of people step back and we're actually getting more failure rates in the ATP testing. And it's because people went, you know, pandemic crazy, right? The, the looting of the toilet papers and stuff. And then they went into pandemic fatigue. Then they went into pandemic anger. And now they're sort of like in pandemic amnesia where they're just like, it, they're just so broken. They're just like, ah, it doesn't exist. I'm not going to clean anymore. I'm not going to do this. And this is some of the businesses that we work with, you know, hair salons and, um, some restaurants and delis and whatnot, you know, even so food service, but food service should always be clean. Right. So I, I don't know what their problem is, but it sounds like you just described the phases of grief. <laughs> That's what we're in right now. Oh well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The anger. So um, this is what I'd love to know. Cause you, you know, it's a, it's a small part of the conversation at this point mm-hmm. did build a, a cleaning and water restoration business and the business is sure. running mm-hmm. and you talk about things in the back of your mind, you built this business and your intention is to keep that business and the new one sustainable and growing and profitable. You said you put a team in place. How are you making sure? What is the day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month energy and focus to keep that sustainable while you're building your new entity? So with the remediation specifically, there's a lot of reports generated. So I basically oversee the reports and I can see based on the metrics. So, so for example, if you have a water loss, you have to put in a dehumidifier, right? And you need a, a drying log. So every day or a humidity log. So every day, you know, it starts at hundred percent if the house is drenched in water and then it should be, you know, 82% the next day and 72% the following day or whatever. And so basically that's how I'm monitoring it just by the reports generated. So if something, if a report comes in and I see a metric that's completely not where it should be, then I obviously have to go back on site and, and sort of rein everybody in. But overall, that's uh, it's a, really a metric-based oversight. So what about, are you looking at metrics for sales? Are you looking at metrics for projects? No, no, no. The sales, it's really, I have nothing to do with the sales, to be honest, at this point for that. It's all adjuster referral based for the remediation. So vendor and, and adjuster based. So that's, so we've sort of, you know, taken ourselves out of competing against other companies for it and built the relationships over the last 10 years. So when an adjuster gets called for a fire loss, you know, a house fire, they'll just call us. So and you have a team that handles it and, and we have a team that handles it and systems are in place. Systems are in place. So the only thing you would hear as essentially you put yourself in what I would call true owner status, you see the red light. If there's a red light and you go in and address that issue, otherwise uh-huh. it's set it and forget it. Set it and forget it. That's it. Because if, if there is something wrong with an insurance based issue, I'm either going to hear it from the, the homeowner. I'm going to hear it from the adjuster, right? So I'm, I'm going to hear it from multiple people. So there's a lot of eyes on it for an insurance job. And your team gets the call. 
So they have an opportunity to handle it, mitigate the issue right. before you ever have to hear anything. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Excellent. How, how, uh, what size team do you have in your uh, remediation company? So we have uh, on staff for the remediation, we have seven people that handle pretty much the, like the warehouse operations and all the equipment and maintaining all of that stuff. And those are really the, the emergency staff. So if some, cause a lot of insurance jobs is emergency based, right? So if the adjuster calls and set, he'll say, or she'll say, I got this claim 20 minutes ago, be on site within two hours. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's like that. Those are those people. Now, if we have to scale up and if we have a commercial fire, we have, pretty much an unlimited bench that we can pull from uh, subwise. Okay. Well, it sounds like you've got a lot of plates in the air, but it also sounds like you've been down this road before. And right. <laughs> the, uh, that entrepreneurial moment where you're like, Hey, I'm going to grow it. I'm going to swing at all the balls that come in. That's and it. Then, then I'll systemize it once it's real. <laughs> and now it's real. So I think a lot of people are going to want to just have a better understanding and, and connect with you. They may want to have questions, you know, ask questions. I think probably communities, are going to hear how they can maybe model what you're doing. And there might be other people who want to help or be a part of what you do to expand because they want to help more people. So how do people right. get in touch with you, Kevin, if they want to be a part of what you're doing or help or reach out or ask questions? Yeah. I mean, the, the easiest way is um, I actually get slammed on, on social media a lot. So it, a lot of factory stuff gets lost there. But, you know, Kevin at trustedsafe.org is my email that goes right to my phone. That's the best way. Because uh, there's a lot of different social media out there. So people, you know, the way Facebook kind of compartmentalizes some of the messaging, you know, you don't get it if it goes to the group or the page or so email, email is the best way. Awesome. Well, Kevin Godfrey, this has been a great interview. I think what you're doing, people are seeing you, the guy who built a business that's now just operating. And you said, hey, there's this other opportunity. You are the epitome of, I see an opportunity I'm mm-hmm. passionate about it. You actually said that word. I, I did. I did. I hate to say it, but I did. Yes. <laughs> you're applying what you've learned over these years to helping more people. And that's fundamental, I think, to building any business. You're listening to what the government wants. You're listening to what the gyms want. Mm-hmm. And you're, that fascination with doing what's essential is what you're doing. And I'm just super appreciative that we had the chance to interview you on the podcast. So oh, thanks for having me on. I had a great time. Yeah, absolutely. I really appreciate it. Thanks for being here. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll, we'll keep connect and hear what's up and hear how things are going. All right. Yeah, I look forward to it. Awesome. All right. All right thanks, this, is, uh, this is Nate Lindquist with the Minimalist CEO Podcast. And thanks for joining us for this very exciting episode with Kevin Godfrey. Uh, he knows where it's at with testing, with making sure that your business is ready to open. And if you want to learn more, make sure you check in the show notes, share what he's up to with trustedsafe.org. And again, Kevin, thank you very much. Thank you, Nate.